Кто не говорит по-русски? А, ну и зачем? И Андреич. Окей. All right, so um, the, the, the topic for today's lecture is descriptive network statistics. Um, and um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about various tools that will allow you to deal with network and um, analyze networks. So as we mentioned last time, um, in general, this is very interdisciplinary course. And um, you know, it, it borrows from the different disciplines, from computer science, from uh, applied mathematics, uh, from uh, sociology, psychology, et cetera, et cetera. So today's part of the course is really based on um, computer science and mathematics. And um, so those with computer science background, well, have a little advantage today because a lot of material will be familiar to them. But I want to make sure we all speak the same language um, and understand the terminology. So the lecture, in some sense, will be self-contained. So we'll try to define uh, pretty much all the terminology we use, we will be using. Uh, but if I miss something, please let me know. Um, interrupt me um, so I can explain things if uh, by chance, again, uh, um, I, I miss it. So the plan for today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about algorithms and you know computations in general, um, and, and and that's very important because this is a practical course, and so you will have to deal with computing things on on graphs, um, and then we'll discuss in more details three major characteristics of uh, social networks. Well, uh, th those that we already emphasized last time, which is a node degree distribution, so how nodes distributed. We'll talk about the average path length in the graph, and we'll talk about clustering coefficient. And if we have a couple minutes left, we'll um, look a little bit at the real world networks and um, what are those, what those parameters, what values they take um, in, in the real world networks. Okay, so uh, computational issues. Um, you know, like typically for computing, it's all about uh, space and time. Right, well, space in the sense that um, all the computations happen, in modern computers, all the computations happens mostly in memory. Um, and so you need to be able, well, at least for those, say, in R, you'll need to be able to put all your data in memory. and It has to fit there. Um, and then computations take some time, right? And depending on the algorithms, uh, you know, it might either uh, finish in a few seconds or takes forever. And so it's very good before you actually even start doing those computations to have an idea whether your computer can handle the data you want to compute on and whether what you want to compute is computable in some meaningful amount of time, right? Well, the good news um, that today's computers, memory is really in gigabytes. I'm pretty sure even on the laptops, they're in gigabytes, and gigabyte is actually 10 to the 9. So that's a lot. Right now, if you think about this, um, you know, integer, uh, just one integer, as when represented, um, it is it takes four bytes, only four bytes, and so uh, you can easily figure out um, how many integers um, you know we we can have in a gigabyte in a gigabyte of memory. Right? It's just 10 to the 9 divided by 4, which is a lot. So if you have, say, 4 gigs like most of the computers, well, you, you, you can easily fit in a billion numbers. Um, and a max integer is 2 to, uh, in this case, in the case of 4 bytes, this is a maximum integer. Now, why am I concerned about integers? Well, first of all, because uh, we're going to represent, when we talk about graphs, we'll have to represent indices, we have to index nodes of the graph. And so we need to make sure we have enough numbers in the computer, enough integers to actually index them. And so, you know, we can actually have up to billion nodes easily. Now, unfortunately, R, uh, though it is very flexible um, as, as a medium for computing and statistical processing, 
it's really not designed for high performance computing. And so it does have a big overhead on the object storage in the sense that uh, you know, integers um, as an object takes not only four bytes, but it can easily take 10 bytes um, of memory. But still, still you can fit a lot. For example, you know, if you have a um, million, let's say you have a million uh, node graphs, which is a million is 10 to the six, right? And let's say um, in R, um, every integer represented by uh, um, 10 bytes, right? Then it is 10 times 10 to the six, which is just 10 megabytes of memory. That's how much it takes order of magnitude to fit a million node graph. So um, the, the reason for these simple computations is just to assure you that with the networks that are the size of the millions, we can handle it. And you can handle it on your laptops and, and R. Now, there is one word of warning that, in fact, when you, in many cases, will be analyzing data. And so you'll be reading in data from, uh, from the files, from the disk. And you, know, you can look up on the computer, OK, what is the, the size of the file? Well, it's really, well, it, it can give you some indication, of course, on how much memory is going to be taken by when you load the file into the computer, into the memory, but it's not equal to it. Uh, very often, files are compressed, and very often, the objects that are being created from those files are much bigger. For example, when I load, say, a graph um, from the standard format .NET um, in, in memory, um, it probably grows uh, twice compared to the file size. And if you take um, the, the file that is being compressed, it even goes growth much higher. The good news, there is a library uh, which is called PRIR um, in um, um, R that allows you to actually check every time. It can allow you to check how much memory the program is taking and allows you to check the, the size of the objects that you have created. Um, it's actually very, very useful, very handy. Um, you know, the, the worst thing you can have is when your uh, computer starts swapping memory, which means um, you, know, you put too much stuff in there and it starts saving things on the disk. Um, that means you know, the, the computations probably will never finish. Um, oh, and by the way, these slides are, are available on our website, so you can always you know, download so you don't have to write things down. Um, and I'll try during the lectures put down here um, the important commands from R, the, the useful commands that, that, that correspond to the slide. OK, so we are safe in terms of space in, in, in most of the cases. We're not going to be dealing with the graphs of the size of the billions. I mean, you know, if you think about it, OK, well, fine. You know, Facebook is, uh, is of the order of, of billions. But you know, we're not going to be computing on the Facebook graph. And the, 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 the rest of them are actually much smaller. Now, we're talking here about only um, computing or only keeping in memory the structure of the graph. Of course, you can have a lot, of, a lot more information um, you know, than the names for the nodes and information associated with nodes. But the point is, um, if you're looking only at the structure, you can easily fit it and you can easily handle pretty large today's graph in R on a laptop. Another problem with computations, and that should be like very much familiar for, for guys with computer science background. You know, this is sort of CS101. Um, it's computational complexity, or you know, it's putting it simply, it's a program execution time, and how that execution time depends on the size of the input. And, and so the usual question is, OK, let's say you, know, you put, um, you know, you, you, the size of your, of your data is 100 units, OK? And it takes five seconds to compute to find the result. Well, what's going to happen if you take, if your size of your data will be 10 times more? We, well, whether this take 50 seconds or maybe you know, 5, seconds, 500 seconds or how many? And, and that is actually what this whole um, complexity story is about. The typical in computer science is what's called big O notation or an upper bound on the time of the execution. And it's a function of the input size. In case of graphs, we usually, we typically will be uh, dealing 
with two types of uh, parameters, right? One type of parameter is a number of nodes in the graph. Um, another type is a number of edges. And uh, various algorithms take different time depending on the number of nodes or depending on the number of edges. Let's say, for example, if algorithm, um, the, the one you, you, you do um, wants to check um, you know, every node and see, I don't know, if, if the nodes, uh, for example, they carry a um, label male or female, and we want to just go through all the nodes and check them. Well, it's obvious that this algorithm will take order of time of the number of nodes because you need to check every node. Or if the algorithm needs to check every edge, well, the algorithm will take time order of number of edges. Now, um, the, the, there are a lot of algorithms that we're going to be using in this course, and we don't need to know, you know internal details of the algorithm, how they work, but um, the, the, we, it, it's good to know their time complexity. Um, the reason for that is because um, some algorithms uh, have very simple time complexity, like linear with respect to the number of points, uh, or, or linear with respect to the size of the graph, but others do not. And um, for example, you know, the, here is just, I listed a few famous algorithms. One of them is, the first one is breadth first search, so traversal of the graph, um, such a way that when you start from the node, you go first to its nearest neighbors, um, then nearest neighbors, and et cetera. So you just, it's sort of waves going um, around the center. Well, that just takes O of M because you know, you, you're traversing edges. Uh, connected components, and we'll talk about them today, takes about order of N plus M. Also not that bad. But other algorithms, they're actually more computationally com uh, <coughs> expensive. Like for example, shortest path, and we're gonna be using a lot of shortest path, has M and log N. If I want to compute all shortest path, and one of the things we're gonna be dealing today is actually looking at that. Um, it's actually O of N squared algorithm. And well, the reason for that is, again, just sort of trivial. If you think about this, you, you want to, you, you'll have like uh, N nodes, so you have to do it. So there's like order of N squared pairs um, to, to, to calculate paths. But the point is, um, if N is a million, well, N squared is already 10 to the 12th. And if this, if this took, let's say, you know, um, if, if you increase the size, the time increases quadratically. And, and so when, if you successfully compute something on the, on the graph of size, on, on the graph um, of size, say thousand, um, it's not obvious that you'll be able to compute it on the graph of size 2000, simply because the time will be not double, but will increase four times. So um, again, this is sort of basic algorithmic issues. Uh, I, you know, if you're familiar with this from computer science, um, yeah. Just bear with me. Um, if you're not, um, just the, again, the, the main point here is different algorithm diff takes different time and they scale differently. And you have to be careful um, when you try to do certain things on a large graphs because this can bite you like really, really hard. Um, the fact that um, time complexity for a lot of algorithms is nonlinear with respect to the size um, of the data. Okay, that is sort of end to the, this computer science introduction. Um, it should be sort of enough to, to get started. Any questions for the, on those slides, on the previous slides? Okay, how many of you guys do have computer science background? Can you just raise your hands? Ah, we don't have computer scientists there? All right, social sciences. Okay, what, what background do you have? Math. Math, so you're all mathematicians. Okay, last question, who has math background? <laughs> so one person, what about the rest? I'm out of, it's not formal. I'm out of options. Okay. 
Um, all right, let, let's move on. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the basics of discrete mathematics. I apologize to, to our mathematician at the back of the room because uh, next five slides will be obvious to you. But again, we would like to speak the same language, all of us. All right, a um, few definitions. A graph is defined as a pair of ordered pair of sets, a set of vertices and a set of edges. And we're gonna try to, through all the lectures, use a notation um, N for the size of the, um, of the vertex set and M for the size of the edge set. So for example, here, um, the vertex set is uh, one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, and edge set consists of edges. And when we use edges, edge is defined as a pair of vertices. Um, we just need to list all the vertices in the graph, and that's gonna be one, two. Um, then there's an edge one, five. So one, two, one, five, two, five, and so on, okay? So if you want to represent a graph, you know, we have to uh, represent vertices and edges. Well, in fact, when you have an edge list, you already implicitly um, number vertices to do that. And so, you know, one of the most popular format actually for storage graphs would be just writing out graph edges and storing graph edges. The equivalent um, description of a graph from a linear algebra is an adjacency matrix. So it's a matrix whose non-zero elements exist there where there is an edge in a graph. So here I show you this little graph and the adjacency matrix is a presentation for that graph. For example, we take, there is a connection between node one and node two, there is an edge. And so here is node one, here is node two, here is an edge between them. This graph is undirected. And so um, the edge, actually for every edge, we have two entries in the matrix. And so it is zero one, and there is this one, it, so which, is, which says we have an edge between um, nodes one, two, and two, one. Well, it's the same edge. So every edge um, written twice in this matrix. And by the way, um, if you look at this matrix, it's obvious that it is symmetric. And um, for example, more optimized ways to store the matrix would be to store just half of the matrix, simply because, let's say we can store half of the matrix, simply because um, the, the other half will be symmetric. But one thing to remember, Undirected graph, symmetric matrix, okay? Um, here is another very simple graph. Now it is a directed graph. Directed means uh, the sort of arrows in the representation, or in other words, the pairs that form edges, they are ordered. So it's important which, which element comes first. So, you know, an edge, say this edge, um, I write as uh, two, I'm sorry, 213, right? And here, uh, just a sort of simpler presentation um, of the matrix. And by the way, um, R also allows you to look at this matrix, the sparse matrix this way. Um, the, the stars are where we have um, edges, right? So for example, here from the first node, only one edge goes to the second node, here it is. But the second node is quite central and it has um, edges going to node 11, nine, eight, four, six, three, et cetera. So here, they're all, all of them. And the matrix is not symmetric. Um, the graph is direct. So quite often we define the, 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 the graph density. So the density of the graph is a ratio of the number of the edges to the maximum possible number um, of edges. And if you have matrix N by N, uh, well, um, we're not talking right, right now about self loops, so we're dealing with N times N minus one options for the, connect, for the connectivity. Now, I, I, this is not only sort of mathematical curiosity, uh, the, this, type, this type of graph, uh, this, this type of picture. Um, very often when you want to look at the large graph, you cannot really draw it. I mean, you know, on the screen, 
okay, it's a thousand nodes, maybe two thousand nodes, couple thousand edges, but that's about it. If you try to draw more, um, you most likely will not be able to visualize the graph. And so if you want to see by your, with your eyes the structure of the graph, what you do is you show adjacency matrix. Um, so I would strongly recommend you to start using these adjacency matrices to actually look at the structure of the graphs. And when the graphs are small, you can actually compare and train yourself to recognize by looking at the matrix what the structure of the graph should look like. But when the graph is large, this is probably the only uh, reasonable way uh, for us to actually visualize things. Now, the whole point of today's lecture is to learn to calculate certain parameters of the graph so that it will help you understand what graph, uh, you know, what graph is without looking at it, without visualizing it. But still, if you can, um, you know, use that. And, and, and there is a, uh, first of all, there is a command uh, in R to do uh, this type of matrix visualization. Um, but, and it's actually called, quite often this is called spy plot because it was sort of originally in MATLAB was done as a spy plot. Um, and that there are external software that allows you to do this. Now, the graph density and, and the graphs we're gonna be dealing with are sparse graphs. They're sparse uh, because there are few edges compare, that are few edges in the graph compared to the total number of edges possible. Because if you look, for example, here at 13 uh, nodes, you could imagine here um, so 13 times 12 um, edges connecting all the nodes, right? Um, well, we do not have them. And so the graph is sparse and the matrix that, that we have here is sparse. So the density will be small. So typical, very typical for us, when you deal with graphs, you will see graph densities like 10 to the minus fifth or around that number. Um, again, if you have dense graphs, it usually means troubles. Okay? The, the, the thing we can compute are usually on the sparse graphs. Okay, another set of definitions. Uh, two vertices are called adjacent if they share a common edge. And for example, these two vertices adjacent because they, they share a common edge. Um, and an edge and the vertex um, that connected are called incident. So it's an incident edge on the vertex. And very important for us, um, notation of the neighborhood of a vertex. Um, the neighborhood of a vertex is a set of vertices adjacent to given vertex. So for example, for vertex one, its neighborhood uh, are these vertices two and five, or for um, node four, its neighborhood consists of three vertices here. Now it's sort of obvious, it's nearest neighbors, but we're gonna be talking about them all the time. And in fact, um, the operations with nearest neighbors is probably the most well-optimized operations um, on, on graphs um, in, in various um, sort of libraries. Uh, and the reason, because it's always when you deal with graphs, what you do is you just sort of um, go, you, you take a node, you either take its neighbors or take its nearest neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. But accessing neighbors is actually um, usually very well optimized and very fast. So, um, and the last and, and the, probably one of the most important definitions for us today is the definition of the degree of a vertex. Well, degree of a vertex is just the size of its neighborhood or the number of you know, closest um, nearest neighbors, you know, the number of friends um, in a Facebook, right? So the degree of node four is three, the degree of node five is three, the degree of node one is two, etc. Trivial but not obvious fact, unless you know it, is that average node degree in the graph can be easily computed from the number as a twice number of edges divided by the number of nodes. Or in other, in other words, um, the total sum of all node degrees in the graph is equal to the two times number of edges in the graph. 
Um, the reason for that is, is because if you think about um, every, every node giving the sort of stubs of edges into the graph, in order for nodes to become connected, these two stubs should form an edge, and so it takes two of those stubs to form one edge. And, and so the number of edges will be half of the total number of stubs, and total number of stubs is total sum of the node degrees. Again, it's a trivial fact, but it's used you know, all of the time in computations. So you know, here is a very famous data set. It's called um, Karate Club data set collected in the 70s. Um, it, it was actually a sociological um, a study um, when, when they studied the Karate Club um, in, in one of the universities. And the Karate Club, um, they, they studied sort of, they did a longitudinal study. Um, they studied friendship. And um, eventually what happened during the study is Karate Club split in two pieces. And uh, um, this became a very, very famous data set for analyzing uh, graphs because um, the, the question was, okay, when you see this data, when you see this graph, can you predict uh, how the graph is going to split because there were like two uh, senior instructors in the club and they finally sort of divorced and, and half of the students went with one instructor and half went with, with other instructor. And you know, even on this sort of visualization, this simple picture, you can probably guess that the split um, happened somewhere there. You know, but we're going to talk about it later in the course, um, how you actually determine where the split could have happened based on the structure. For right now, just looking at those nodes, we're going to talk about the degrees, which means number of friends. And again, node 26, for example, um, has a degree three, so it has three friends. Um, node 15, um, friends with two people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's not very obvious uh, just by looking at this picture, you know, what node degrees are. Um, but we can easily do a different visualization and actually rescale the nodes proportionally to uh, the node degrees. And then you realize that there are several nodes with a very high node degree, you know, these two nodes. There are little more nodes um, with, a, with a smaller node degrees. And there are a lot of nodes with very small node degrees. Um, by the way, though, uh, you know, the goal of this lecture and the goal of this presentation is to teach you about you know, node degrees, vertex degrees. Um, also pay attention on the, on the sort of types of visualization I'm using. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere using iGraph and somewhere uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where I'm, when I'm using a different program. And, and so um, in your homework, um, you should be able to actually reproduce pretty much all the pictures I'm showing you at the lecture. Um, and the code is available. So um, if you want to show a graph where you can explicitly show the, the, the size, where you explicitly show the number of neighbors for the node, it's sort of traditional and customary, scale the size of the node proportionally to um, node degree. So in this graph, it's sort of obvious that we have a couple nodes. Um, of the larger node degree um, and like lots of nodes with small node degree. It's a good idea to look at the node degree histogram, which is really just the count uh, where we're really counting how many nodes of different degrees we have in the graph. And so, for example, it's very clear that this graph is dominated by the node's degree of, of, of size two. Um, so there are like around probably 12 nodes right, of, of size two. There were a couple nodes of very high node degree, which is, you know, 16, 17 connections. And there is a sort of, you know, decreasing distribution. Uh, interesting um, that, that we had, you know, pretty much only one person with, with, with one connection. But this uh, node degree histogram is probably the first thing you do when you, when you, when you try to um, understand what graph look like um, without actually drawing the graph. Okay, so we actually shown on this histogram just the numbers, um, numbers of numbers of connections. Um, usually, people write or use what's called a degree distribution, which is a normalized number of connections. So, to calculate the degree distribution, what we do is we just take the number 
of friends for every node and divide by the total number of uh, nodes in the graph. More formally, if ki, and that's how we mostly through the lecture will define the node degree. So it will be um, k, uh, so index i means the node number i. So ki um, is a node degree or a number of nearest neighbors for every node. Um, and um, n sub k will be the number of nodes with that degree. So the, then the degree distribution is just a fraction of the nodes with that degree. Um, in other words, it's a probability that if you randomly pick up a node, it will have a particular degree, all right? So if, you, if I look back here and renormalize it, you know, the probability, if I randomly pick up a node, um, the highest probability would be to pick up the node number, the, the node with a degree two. So here's another graph. Now, this, is, this data set is also given to you um, within the iGraph package. Uh, it's called yeast data set. It's actually much larger. It has several thousand nodes and more than 10,000 edges. And um, I used the, the program is called YED to visualize this. Now, it looks like a mess. Um, and this is a, an example that, that you know, the, the, there is a limit to what you can do with with, with visualization. Um, one point of showing this graph to you is to show you, well, first of all, um, yeah, there, there is a big chunk um, of connections there. But you also see in this graph that there are quite a few nodes with degree one, right? They're here on the fringes of the graph. Okay, and there are also nodes with degree two and three, etc. There are some nodes that are disconnected from the mainland, from the main graph. We'll talk about it. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But for us, for a moment, what's important to us is there is like a, like a big variety of of node degrees in this graph, and I can plot it. Right, I can plot the degree distribution. It's very clear that it is dominated by the nodes of degree one. So the majority of the nodes are degree one. And there are some nodes of very high degree. Um, again, if we randomly pick up one node, it will be node of degree one. So the de degree histogram, again, this is probably where you always start your study of, of the graph. Um, there, and again, there is a degree distribution command in, um, in R. Now, showing this type of graphs is actually bad taste. Because here, well, okay, here you might be able to see something, right? Um, but looking, starting from somewhere around here, what's happening there, you can hardly see in a graph. And, we, and we, if we switch to a larger networks, and again, we want to deal with real world networks, you know, very often you will see this type of picture, which is you know, almost unreadable. Still, still, you can sort of extract some information from here. And again, just to remind you here, we have a node degree. Um, this is a degree distribution, so the probability of that um, randomly selected node will have that degree, you realize that the nodes with degree close to zero, which is uh, in this case degree one, has the highest probability. So majority of the nodes in this graph also have degree one. And you can also realize that there are some nodes with extremely high degree, but there are very few of them. There's actually, you know, if, if you can zoom in here, you would see there's just only one node with that huge degree and there is a couple nodes with a small degree. So again, on the x-axis, this is the degree of the nodes. So this is like, for example, says 600, right? So there is, a, there is a one node with degree more than 600. But the majority of the graph lives somewhere here. And in, on this picture, we cannot read it. So, you know, what do you do? So what, what do you do when you have a graph like that? Oh, speak, speak up. Yeah, 
Well, what we can do is actually we can switch the scales. We can actually go to what's called log, log scale. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna show, instead of showing just the, the numbers, you know, just taking probability here, we have probability and the node degree. What we're gonna do, we'll take logarithm of node degree and logarithm of probability. Um, that's what you always do when you have numbers uh, of very large, of, with very large scale difference. And if I do it, that's what the degree distribution is gonna look like. And this is sort of a signature distribution for um, typical what's called power law graphs, and we'll talk about why it is called power law in a few minutes. How you read this? Well, exactly the same way. Um, if you look, uh, look carefully at the axis, it's actually a logarithmic axis. So it, it says one here, 10 here, 100 here, okay? Um, and the same, it's, it's also logarithmic, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus two there. Um, and, um, you know, you look at this and you say, okay, well, um, what is this? Let's say that how many, we can calculate how many nodes have a degree 10 um, or how many nodes have a degree 100. Now, the reason it looks like stripes here is, is very simple. It's just the stripe corresponds to a number one. Um, well, actually logarithm of one, which is zero in this case, um, on the side, on the scale. Um, what happens here is we just have a single node um, of that size. We have a single node, again, uh, of that size, and there's a single node of, of the largest size, right? Size in terms of number of um, connections. So that's what, uh, Typical, typical degree distribution for social network looks like. Now, our goal would be, when we look at the network, to be able to actually draw this and to be able to see what type of distribution it is. And um, the very characteristic thing for, for um, power law graphs is the fact that we have here almost straight line, almost straight line. And we'll talk about it in a second, why it is so. Before we go there, um, let's just give you, I'll give you a quick reminder on, on a discrete, uh, on, on the distribution things. Um, I, I think you were supposed to talk about it last time um, uh, at the at seminar, but just to make sure we're on the same page. So we have a discrete random variable, xi. Um, we often we define a, what's called you know, probability mass function, um, which is a, just the probability that the random variable takes certain value. And as a probability mass function, it has to be uh, non-negative, and uh, you know the total sum of all the probabilities should be equal to one. And from that, we can define two additional functions. One is called cumulative distribution function, or CDF, which is a probability that your random variable is less than something, right? So if you have a bunch of possible values, you know, this is a probability that it is on the left of your selected value. And what's important for us, it's called complementary, complementary cumulative distribution function, CCDF, which is, uh, the probability that a randomly selected variable is greater, so it's on the right. Just here is a simple example. This is literally histogram that we did before. You know, let's say um, that, that the numbers here are node degrees, and there is a probability that we have a node degree 10, the probability is one ninth, node degree of, um, Node degree 11 is 2 ninth, node degree 12 is 1 third, node degree 13, 2 ninth, node degree 14, 1 ninth. Right, this is, so this will be gonna be probabilities. So if we want to deal with cumulative distribution function, it pretty much means the following. Um, at 12, it is 
two-thirds. Why the two-thirds at 12? Well, because it just says what the probability that um, my node degree is less or equal to 12. So the probability that is um, that node degree is less or equal to 12 is equal to the probability that is 10, which is 1, 9, plus probability that is 11, which is 2, 9, and probability that it is 12, which is 1 third, right? Which makes it equal to 2 thirds. So that is sort of the, 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 the basic, I think, of, of probability theory. Um, now, the reason you might want to use, instead of distribution, you might want to use cumulative distribution is because it's an aggregate form. And if your original data has some noise, um, this will smooth it out. Um, what I don't have on this graph is what's called C CDF or complementary um, cumulative distribution function. Complementary cumulative distribution function, as we defined on the previous slide, is just one minus CDF, or it is the probability that random variable is greater than some number x. And so if I have to draw this function here, it's gonna be look, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna have steps. Just think about it, it's just one minus this staircase. So it's gonna have steps here. Um, well, probably do a bad job, but something like that. Um, and it's again, the, the way to understand this is that the probability that any node is greater that the degree of any node is greater than zero, well, it is one because all the nodes have a probability greater than zero. The probability that any node has a degree greater than 14, it is zero because all the node has degree less than zero. And in between, well, it's, it's just a sum of the probabilities from that point on to the right. Um, if you're not familiar with, with uh, PDFs, CDFs, uh, it, it takes some time to kind of get used to them. Now, you will understand in a few slides the reason why um, I'm talking about this, um, the, the cumulative distribution function. The analog you might be familiar with from um, you know, probability theory is just a continuum variable. And for continuous variable, we, we usually define PDFs, probability distribution function, and PDF. Um, it is given as a probability that for random variable in between A and B, it's given by the integral of that function. And analogously, um, we can define um, CDF here as an integral from minus infinity to the point and uh, complementary CDF, which, is, uh, uh, which will be an integral from that point up to the infinity. So if you have a, um, some function that is distributed say p of x distributed such a way, then f from x will be in this integral and um, cumulative function will be this integral from the point onward. Again, this is an integral measure. And um, as always, if you have noise or something wrong with the data, integrals will smooth it out. The same way as, you know, if you have a noisy data, you shouldn't differentiate it because derivatives will increase the number of, the, increase the noise. Um, at the same time, you know, integrals, they smooth things out. So these are, these are the basics. Now, here to the sort of the meat of this, um, of this discussion of power laws. Well, power laws is, um, is the following. The distribution, has, is following the power law if it has the following shape. If the probability of the variable to take some value is inversely proportional to that value to some power. So you can write it as Cx to the minus alpha or C divided uh, by X to the power alpha. Okay, and it, the, the name power law stands from sort of from, from this that, that you put this thing into the power. So typical power law would be P of X is equal to say um, C divided by X cubed or P of X can be C divided by 
um, x to the fourth. So this is a typical represent representative of power law, power law distribution. And you can easily calculate um, this, this value for C if you need to, you know, by just normalizing, remembering that this is distribution. Now, one thing to note is that here we have divided, right? And, and so it means um, the power law cannot start at zero. Um, it has to start at some minimal value because otherwise, uh, you know, uh, it will go to infinity. And, and then um, it's sort of very obvious, and this is the reason why we actually decided to look at the CDF. Look. If we take power law PDF, which is CX uh, to the minus alpha, and we calculate this complementary cumulative distribution function. Well, by definition, it's an integral from X to infinity. If we take this value and substitute it here and take the integral, we're gonna have this X to the minus um, alpha minus one. And so it's a different constant, x to the minus alpha minus one. The distribution itself is x to the minus alpha. So what this means is that contrary to very many distributions, in the case of power law, the distribution itself and the cumulative, or I'm sorry, and complementary cumulative distribution pretty much has the same shape with only difference <clears throat> that the power of exponent is different, okay? So if we had x minus three, for example, here, well, this is gonna be x minus two. And the last important piece um, to understand this whole story is that now, if we take this distribution and think about plotting them in a logarithmic scale, which means we have this P of X, say, is equal to CX minus alpha. To see what it's gonna look like in a logarithmic scale, we'll take logarithm on both right side and left side. And the logarithm on the left side will split instantaneously into sum of logarithm and logarithm of X to the power of alpha will be minus alpha log x, all right? And that's what's written here. If we look at the cumulative distribution function, uh, I'm sorry, if complementary cumulative distribution function and do the same exercise, we get that. So as a function of x, notice that they're almost identical. So the difference is here is alpha and alpha minus one. Now, the shape of this is a straight line because if you put here logarithm, call this y, so this is our y axis, and you call logarithm x, I don't know, we'll call it z. Well, there is a straight line because it says y equal, say, c prime minus alpha z, right here, y equal c prime minus alpha z. So it's a straight line. And for this guy, it's also be a straight line, but just with less, with, with less slope. So the, the point of this exercise, the exercise we just did, is to show that the power law, when shown in logarithmic scales, you take logarithm on every axis, is actually looks like a straight line. And moreover, the complementary distribution function also looks like a straight line. And so if you, for example, um, calculate the complementary distribution function, you can from that calculate, um, the, the, the easily calculate the value of the slope parameter. Now that is um, sort of very important characterization of the graph. Now, 
I will not go into the details here. Those of you with a background in mathematics can later look into this. Um, but, but the key point here is the following, that the power law distribution is kind of an interesting cookie. It's an interesting distribution. If you try to take and calculate averages or try to calculate, say, for example, second momenta, you quickly realize that the integral will diverge for some values of alpha. Well, just think about this. If, for example, alpha is 1.5, then, uh, and you want to calculate average of certain value, it's going to be um, x times the distribution function, which puts you x to the power alpha minus 1. Um, 1 1.5 minus 1 is 0.5, so you end up with integral dx over square root of x, which is proportional to the square root of x if you take this integral. But you have infinity on, on, on the upper limit of the integral, so it diverges. And so it doesn't make any sense, right? So you have some sort of distribution, and the mean value diverges. So what that means, in fact, is the following. Compared to many other distributions, power law is, is quite unstable in a sense. And so if, if um, the the, the, the exponent of, of power law is less than three, then means and standard deviation will depend on the sample size. Now, this is terrible from the point of view of statistics. It really means you cannot estimate mean or standard deviation um, by sampling the data. The good news, in a lot of real world networks, alpha is greater or equal than three. And so we are safe. But you have to be careful because um, if um, you, you have a distribution with alpha less than three, the numbers that you calculate, the averages of that distribution, the, 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 the standard deviation and all other things will actually be wrong because you, know, you, you get more data, um, you, you, your numbers will change dramatically. Though the whole point of, of like statistics measurements, right, is when you have a sample, um, it gives you approximation, you get more data, you get closer, but it shouldn't like grow. And this one will grow. Okay, I know this is a sort of subtle moment. Uh, you know, again, it will be easier for those of you who actually um, have, have corresponding background. Um, I'll skip a couple of slides here. Just Again, getting back to our story with no degrees, to remind you, so we, we started this whole thing to actually um, calculate the degree distribution for the nodes, which are integers. I switched to integrals only to show you um, how things are done you know, with integration, because with, with integrals, it's easy to compute things. Um, you can, the same way you can define the CDF and complementary CDF, which is just the sum of all the nodes with degrees less than given or with degrees greater than given. And power law distribution you know, looks the, the, the same way as, as, as before. Um, it's just instead of x, it's k, which is a number of neighbors. And if you look um, at the logarithmic scale, yeah, we're going to see uh, log equal minus gamma log k and log c. And if we use this as c, y, it's going to be minus gamma x plus, well, let's call it C prime. And if this is X and this is Y. And, and so on a, on a graph, on a log log scale, it's gonna look like a straight line. And it almost does. Now, this is a PDF. You, one thing you notice that because of this stripes here, it's really hard to you know, figure out the slope. It's not clear if you're going to match the slope this way, or you're going to match slope this way, or, or, or how you're going to draw it. Um, because remember, we're looking for the straight line. Well, if you actually do cumulative, uh, complementary cumulative distribution function, the one we talked about, it's going to be look, looking much smoother and much nicer. And it's much easier here to draw 
straight line either here or maybe a little here through them. Well, sorry, lines are not straight, but that's not me, that's iPad. Um, so, and then you can actually estimate the slope. Now, you can estimate the slope like, you know, any way you want. Um, you can just put a ruler and, and, and place a ruler here, you know, and measure, and measure the angle, right? Uh, probably not the best way to do it, but you can do it, right? Um, you can stick it in any statistical software and estimate slopes. Um, there is a better way to do this, um, and it's called parameter estimation model. It's done through what's called maximum likelihood. And the idea is that when you have a distribution, think about this distribution as generated by a bunch of random or independent events. And then you can try to you know, maximize the probability of whatever being generated by your model to look like your real data. And this is done through a procedure called maximum likelihood. And it actually gives you the result. It gives you numbers. So it gives you the value for the parameter alpha, and it gives you a value for the error. And the only thing you need to, uh, in order to calculate those numbers, would be the values. And you need the minimum, x min. x min is where your distribution starts. So if you select it here, it will try to feed you know, the straight line um, starting from here. If you select x min here, it will start to feed straight line from here. If you select x min here, it will try to feed your straight line from there. So selecting x min is actually sort of an art form. And depending on that, you will have different numbers. There is also more or less automatic procedure to find the optimal um, x min value. Again, uh, you know, you're lucky there is, in iGraph, there is actually a function that allows you to do this. All right, now the reason we spend so much time discussing it is because um, the power law distribution is the sort of the signature distribution for networks, for social networks. Not all of them will look exactly like that. You will have, you will see distributions maybe, you know, not, uh, not that straight. Um, you will see not that smooth. You will see, might, you might see distribution that looks like uh, sort of more here and then goes down there or maybe a little bit sort of that way. But the point is, in log-log scale, all of them very similar to this. And, th and, and, and uh, the way to describe this distribution is through this exponent, and, and that's the number that being computed here. This is this number. And so this is one of the sort of important characteristic of um, any distribution um, you want to look at. Okay, before we move on, any questions on here? No questions. Okay. <clears throat> um, there are a couple more things we need to, to talk about today. Um, and one of them is a graph connectivity. I again start with a few definitions, very simple definition. Um, you know, a path from vertex i to vertex day, j is a sequence of edges that join those two vertices, right? And, and, and so the path from, say, vertex 1 to vertex 8 um, is just a sequence of edges. And that means edge 1, 4 and edge 4, 8. Right, or it can be also given um, as ordered list of vertices, right, such that the edge between them. So you can also say that the, the path is one, four, eight. This is the path from one um, to eight. Now, very important definition for us: graph is called connected if there is a path between any two vertices. And so this graph is disconnected. Because, you know, you take a vertex 4 and there is no way to get um, to the vertex 5. In fact, in this graph, we have two what's called connected components. And connected component is a maximal connected subgraph. And a subgraph is a part of graph, right? A subset of the sets of the nodes and the edges. Um, and we have two of those here, 1 and 2. And so when I say connected components, it really means I'm looking for all the nodes that are connected between themselves. 
when I say how many connected components, is it how many of those pieces of graph um, are out there? Pieces from where? From one piece you cannot get onto another following the edges of the graph. For example, getting back to this picture, the picture with um, you know, the, the yeast graph, connected component nicely. So this is a one connected component. And then there are lots and lots of smaller components that are nicely positioned here. These are individual components. Again, this visualization done with YED. So there are actually, within this graph, there are 92 components. So there are 92 pieces of the graph that are not connected to each other. And the very interesting point here is look at the sizes. There is what's called gigantic connected component. So the majority of the nodes are actually connected. And this is the size of it. Oh, and by the way, the size of the network is, is around, uh, uh, I forgot. It will show in some other slide, but like around 2,500, I think. So the size of, this is how many nodes in the gigantic, connect, in the gigantic component here. And then this is the sizes of the rest. And there was like you know, 91 of those. Again, this is a very, very, very typical for the graphs we're going to study. They're going to have a gigantic connected component. The majority of the, of the nodes will be connected in there. And they'll have a bunch of little components out there on the side. And they're like literally little. And so very often when you study those graphs, you actually extract this gigantic connected component. You extract the largest connected component and you deal with it. This is a picture for what's called Flickr graph. Flickr graph is a friendship network from the uh, Flickr. And this is actually a huge graph. Um, so it has a million um, nodes um, and three million connections. So um, th this is a friendship graph. So connection means a friendship between two nodes. Now, it's actually very, very fractured because, you know, as you can imagine, uh, OK, and by the way, this is a Flickr graph circa, I think, 2000, uh, you know, four, where Flickr was just barely starting. And so what it means um, that you get a bunch of separated groups of people, you know, photographers that know each other, uh, you know, talk to each other, um, but there are a lot of separated. And, and so here there was like actually around 700,000 components. But even in this picture, there is a gigantic connected component. So Aside from those simple small groups of, of, of photographers, there is somewhere this huge monster of them connected, right? It's also dominating. And the, there are a lot of sort of smaller ones. Again, when you have this difference in scale, you should plot it into the log log. Again, here is a log log. And you know, big surprise, you see, see the straight line. It means the size of the connected components is also power law distributed. So what this means, again, looking at this picture, that the, the majority of components, you know, we have singletons. So a lot of people just put their picture there and not making friends with anybody. Um, and, and there are sort of people, there are that many people with, with you know, two connections. So this was one connection with two connections. Um, but then there is this gigantic component. It stays like way, way outside of, of the sort of normal distribution. And if you look at the distribution, it does look like a um, straight line. It's also power law. So in these graphs, pretty much, I don't want to overgeneralize, but majority of the metrics um, statistically will do look like power laws. So power laws is all over the place in, in these graphs. And I mean, it, it's maybe not that surprising because again, it got, comes from the structure, from, from the distribution of the node degrees. So um, why do we care about this? Well, because we really want to understand the distance between vertices, right? We need to be able to calculate how far are two people from each other and how big the graph sort of geometrically, right? So, um, and the notion is uh, based on what's called distance between the graph, right? A distance between nodes on the graph. And the distance is given um, between any two nodes as a shortest path 
from one node to another. Again, path is just a sequence of, of nodes and edges, and we're looking for the shortest one, the one that has the smallest um, size. So if we have, by whatever reason, I don't have a, yeah, I don't have a picture here, but um, say we have some graph, and I want to calculate um, the, the shortest path, um, say between the distance between this node and this node, um, the distance will be the, sh the shortest path, which will be here, here, here. So it is three, it will not be um, this, 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 this. It's also a path, but this path has a length four, this path has a length three, so the short shortest path is three, so the green one give us the distance. So distance between node and three. So graph diameter is the largest possible shortest path. And so we just look for two nodes that are um, <clears throat> furthest apart and say in this case, it is say this node and, and this node. Well, they're all three and, and from here to, okay. From here, one, two, three, it's also three. So I guess the diameter for this, for this graph is actually three, right? Um, the, the maximum shortest path. But what's important is not only that, and, and we'll see in a second, what's important is what's called average path length. So average path length is defined as just sum over all possible paths divided by um, how many of them are there. Now, remember, we're talking here about connected component. So we're talking about the graph that is connected, which means you can get from every node to any other node. If, when you try to use this formula, <clears throat> uh, you get uh, a disconnected component, well, the distance between those, if we have two components in the graph, and we're trying, and we consider this as a, our graph. Well, the distance will be infinite. And so it depends on the program what it can tell you. And lots of um, libraries or programs, they, they do actually ask you how do you want to handle the situation when um, your graph is disconnected. So, you know, in order to be safe, it, it's better to just, when you calculate those things, first check the con con uh, connectedness of the graph, and if it is connected, then you can easily calculate um, average path and diameter, et cetera, et cetera. It's also important to notice um, the, the difference. So diameter gives you the maximal distance, maximal distance between two nodes. So it gives you like sort of the furthest node apart, nodes apart in the network. And which means the following, if you have a network that looks something like this. So we have a bunch of things here, and then we have a long, long tail here. Well, by doing that, I can immediately show you that, that the, the diameter dramatically increases. Now the diameter of this graph is one, two, three, four, five, um, you know, six, what is it, seven, eight, right? The diameter of this graph is eight. Um, but the graph is actually, you know, the, the way it sort of looks like it hasn't changed a lot. It just got this, you know, one long tail, but the diameter dramatically changed. At the same time, if we calculate average path lengths, it would not change that much because yes, it will add this path lengths, but it will be um, sort of, you know, uh, leveled out or compensated in, in the total sum. And so the diameter is a sort of curious number, but the reality, the description of the graph should be done through average path length. And in fact, it's better to even calculate the distribution of the length. So sample the graph and calculate all the difference. You know, take two nodes, calculate the distance between them. Take two nodes, calculate the distance between them. Take two nodes, calculate the distance between them. And um, that will help you to actually understand the distribution of the connectivity in the graph. Again, there are a lot of um, 
functions in, in iGraph that allows you to do this. You know, you can calculate shortest path, you can calculate diameter, average path length, path length histogram. Um, that's all there. Just remember um, that compared to node degree, these computations already ha can have from m plus um, n log n to like O of n squared complexity. And so, which means if you try to do this in a large graph, it might take a lot of time or, you know, you might, it might not finish ever. So those computations already sort of, you have to be careful with, with the complexity. So this is the same yeast graph, the same the sort of crazy uh, um, graph you've seen in the, uh, looking in yellow. Oh, and by the way, this is, a, this is the size of a graph. And this is an example of sort of diameter and average path lengths. So diameter on this graph is 15, but average path length, path length only five. So um, let me sweep back to this graph. Here is a graph. So there is probably, you know, there is probably some very long path like that that gives you the diameter of the graph, which is that uh, 15. But on average, the distance between nodes are around five. And that happens because there is, again, there is a sort of very, very tightly connected um, center in there. So this is a distribution. This is a histogram. Uh, and you see the largest, again, you'll see the largest um, path length, which is 15. And there's like very few of those. And that's the diameter of the graph. But the, dis the whole thing is distributed around five, right? And so the average path length is, is, is five. And so again, if you want to have one number um, characterizing the, the connectivity in your graph, go for average path lengths. Um, if you want to sort of get a better picture, go for the histogram. So for us, histogram is sort of the way to understand the graph without you know, drawing the graph itself. OK, any questions um, on this one? All right. So the last uh, quick topic today is, is the notion of a clustering coefficient. We already touched upon it last time, um, but the idea is, is the following. So you have a graph, and uh, as we discussed last time, you know, it, it's very plausible that if you have two friends, that those friends know each other, right? And that really means, you know, you have two friends, one friend, another friend, and it's very plausible there is a high probability that they know each other. So it means that there is a triangle in there. And it happens that social networks do have a lot of triangles. And the characteristic, numerical characteristic of that is what's called clustering coefficient. Now, there are several of them. We have to be careful here just because you know, again, there is sort of several definitions available. There is a global clustering coefficient, which is defined as a three times number of triangles to the number of connected triple of vertices. Now, triple of vertices, here it just counts like, okay, here's a triple, you know, here is a triple, here's a triple, here's a triple. So pretty much triple of vertices is anything it's this sort of simple shape, right? And then you just take this and match it anywhere. And the triangles, well, you know, it triangles. So what you do is you match the triangles and count how many of them, and you count how many of these shapes you can put on the graph. And this is connected triples, that's number of triangles. Now, the, the three there is just because um, to sort of balance this off, um, every triangle is a three, triples, right? Because you can, you know, do this triple or that triple or that triple. And that's a number. Um, it's also sometimes called a transitivity. Um, the reason for that is because, um, you know, uh, the, the sort of the notion, you know, from, from a set theory from um, things, if A, for example, equivalent to B or A is equal to B, B is equal to C, then the fact that A is equal to C, or in this case, there is a connection. Is, is called a transitivity principle, right? From A equal to B and B equal to C, it follows that A equal to C. Well, in this case, from the connection A to B, B to C, is, there is a connection A to C. Um, and so sometimes it's called transitivity. And in fact, um, iGraph uses 
the, the terminology transitivity to actually um, do this, to, to calculate this number. Now, there is alternative um, definition for, um, well, not alternative, but additional definition, what's so-called local clustering. So local clustering coefficient is a number that um, describes the, the clustering around the vertex. So which means if you have a vertex here and you have a few neighbors, a few friends, and those, let's say, friends know each other. Uh, let me do it this way. So let me do it here this way, right? Um, so what it says is the following. You have four friends and, you know, just two of them know each other. And so what you calculate is a number of links in your local neighborhood and divide by the maximum possible uh, number of links. So it's the same idea. You're just literally counting the triangles that have you as one of the, of, of the, of the vertices and just normalize by the total number of possible triangles with you in the center. And taking this local clustering coefficient, you can get distribution, you can get you know, clustering coefficient per node, and you can calculate um, average clustering coefficient for the entire graph by averaging it out. Now, one important point here is these guys are not equal. They're not the same. Well, it just happened that there is this two separate definitions. One just counts the number of global triangles and, and tells you, you know, the, 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 the clustering coefficient. Another definition um, counts sort of local structure, local triangles based on, 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 the, on the center of for every node. Um, but if you average it, it will be a different number. Um, so people, when there, there's, there, and then they might differ. And so when people talk about clustering coefficients, it's, it's important to understand what they do. If they say average clustering coefficient, it's usually average um, clustering for every node. If they talk about global clustering coefficient or characteristic of the graph, it's usually this number. And again, um, this is a yeast graph. This is a clustering coefficient. And um, the global clustering coefficient here is 0.468. Remember, again, this is sort of the ratio of the number of triangles to the number of triples. So it really tells you that, you know, there are a lot of triangles in this graph, right? Plenty of triangles. On the other hand, here's a distribution. Now, uh, it's a distribution of the sort of, of, of the local clustering of the nodes. And we see there are quite a few nodes um, with this local clustering zero, which really means that they look like this or like this. So it means they're not connected to each other. I mean, there is no triangles in, in the neighborhood. But at the same time, um, there are a bunch of nodes that has all their neighbors are tightly interconnected, right? Um, that's what this peak tells you. So again, sweeping back to um, the, the picture itself, you realize, yes, indeed, there are a lot of nodes here, there are a lot of nodes here that are on the sort of straight lines and, and there is no tri triangles around them. They're not forming triangles. But it's clear that there is a bunch of triangles here, there, there, and of course, you know, in the middle of this mess. So again, instead of drawing a graph, and I mean, you know, for that graph 2000 um, edge nodes, we, we still were able to, to do it. For a lot of graphs, you will, you will not be able. And, and so the clustering coefficient also tells you a story about the structure of the graph. Um, here are a few examples for power law networks in, in the real world, um, just to convince you that, um, that the theory we, we did um, is not just some, some random theory. This is actually from the very first paper by Albert Barabashi, where he um, discovered that. Um, and, and this is a for, um, uh, <clears throat> for what's called actor collaboration network, where there's a collaboration between actors 
uh, in, in the different movies. You know, there is a, it's a graph where there is an edge between two actors if they film together in the same film. Um, and, and this is for, uh, for World Wide Web and, and this um, for Power Grid in US. And all of them, it's a log-log distribution. In all cases, you see um, there is this characteristic um, slope. Um, this one is another paper, goes back to 1999. It's one of the first crawls of the entire web. And again, when you look at the distribution function, it does look like um, it's power law. So it's a, sort of the first proof that the World Wide Web is a power law. Now, in general, this is uh, probably barely readable table, uh, but you, know, you can look at the slides later to see it. Um, here is a bunch of networks um, that has been analyzed by scientists. And um, what's shown here is, well, the type of the network, you know, the social network, information, technological, biological network, and um, sort of different names of the networks. And the fact is, pretty much all those networks available. And so you can actually download and, and try yourself um, calculating parameters. And here is a uh, number of nodes, number of edges. This is average uh, node degree. And you can see that, for example, for the film actor uh, graph, the average node degree is 110. Um, say, uh, for telephone call graph, which means how many on average uh, people uh, irregular calling it, uh, three, um, you know, World Wide Web, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are important things like alpha, which is the parameter we talked about, which is a power law degree exponent. And you can see here it's 2.3, 3.2, 3.0, and the clustering coefficients. So um, you can also see that. So this is actually quite an interesting thing to study, uh, you know, when you have time uh, and, and just sort of appreciate um, that the, those networks are, on one hand, very different. On the other hand, are very, very, very similar. And so the bottom line um, of today's lecture, um, what I want you to take out from this is, first of all, that there is this power law degree distribution um, that is very, very sort of the, probably the best signature of the social network and um, in the log, log scale degree distribution looks like a straight line. Well, almost a straight line, give or take. Second, that um, the average path length is usually pretty small, and that's what you need to measure um, in, in those graphs, that you have a high clustering coefficient, so there are a lot of triangles, and then there is exist typically gigantic connected components, so your graph has a lot of components, one of them will be much, much larger um, than others. And pretty much all of those things, the statistical measures, um, all of them can come with a distribution of, of those measures across a graph. Um, and, and there are the signatures that helps you to analyze a graph um, without plotting it. In terms of the references, um, actually last time I forgot to mention this book. Um, well, this I strongly recommend. It's a very short book. Um, it's written by Eric uh, Kalazuk and Gabor Sardi. And Gabor is actually the author of iGraph package. And so this book is really about how to use this package to analyze graphs. Okay, so it, it has a lot of code um, and a lot of examples that will help you to familiarize yourself with, with, with graphs. And, and it's available as PDF, you know, if you search online. Um, and then there are classical references, of course, you know, Wasserman and Faust, um, social network analysis for a lot of definitions, and the book by um, Mark Newman on networks that's a little bit more mathematical. And there are a couple of papers um, on power law distribution, how to handle um, power law distribution in these graphs if you want to do some sort of more precise computations. Well, that's it for today. And it's very dark there in the room. I can barely see anything. Is it really dark or it's the computer that, that cannot? Yeah, it's really dark. Ah, uh, you put air. So I'm putting everybody to sleep and you turn the lights off. Great job. All right. Okay, guys. Um, if there was no questions, well, wake up. Good morning, right? And uh, uh, we'll have a seminar 
And on, on, on this lab, um, guys will, will work with you and actually trying to, on, on the real data, trying to calculate all those parameters on, on the real networks using R and iGraph. All right, shall we take a break? Thank you.